We're still so focused yeah. on selling the metal, you know, and moving the metal that we kind of forget customers are still not at the center point of everything that we do. Yeah. There, there are certain things I think we're getting better with, but it's not everything yet. Hey, hey, what's going on, Podcast Nation? It's Jason Harris here with Digital Dealership Solutions. Hey, thanks for joining me on another episode of Strategy with Jason. <laughs> today, I have my guest, Michael Roth. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to come jam with me today. And I know we got some time before we started shooting to talk about some really interesting things. So I'm super, super excited about today's chat. Uh, but before we do that, if you can give the audience just a couple minute back, or two minute background of uh, what your company does, and then we'll dive right into it. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me, Jason, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm the, uh, the president and CEO of the Canadian Finance and Leasing Association. We represent the asset-based finance company uh, companies throughout Canada. Mm -hmm. It's about a $400 billion industry in Canada, so quite sizable. So that little tiny one, right? Well, a yeah, tiny yeah, bit, yeah, but okay. as a subset <laughs> of the broader finance industry, it's, it's, uh, it is quite niche. It's about $128 billion churn annually. Wow. We represent about 250 members in that sector from equipment, auto, so now predominantly consumer auto and the OEMs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, on the fleet side, it's about 250 corporate members uh, currently. That's so cool. So one of the big reasons I wanted to jam with you is that I feel this fundamental shift happening, you know, and I don't feel like enough people are talking about it. And, and um, more people that talk on the financial side of our automotive industry, they see it and feel it more. So I thought who better than, you know, to bring in the expert on what's going on as far as trends within leasing and financing. So if you can just kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, what you're seeing within this year, and how that's kind of varied over the past previous years. So, you know, you you're right. There, there has been a sort of a seismic change mm -hmm. um, in the the finance and uh, um, IT worlds. I think that this conversation has been happening a little bit longer mm -hmm. in the uh, auto dealer world, perhaps a little bit less so. You know, we do represent um, the credit facilities for the OEMs, but we do increasingly see a number of uh, buy, he, buy here, uh, pay here type um, financial institutions from the dealer group. So, uh, in house leasing programs and that uh, sort of activity coming uh, to uh, to the CFLA as as, as Potential members. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the biggest drive or, or or change is is the increasing importance of data and technology and sort of driving sort of uh, the you know the ROI to the uh, the dealer principal and and the, the auto group itself more broadly. And, and I think it's really important. In fact, actually, I'm um, I'm actually presenting uh, next week in Detroit on how to create the a data driven culture. You know, and, and data is not it has to be used in every single part of our business. And um, let's face it. As far as the automotive industry goes, we have not done an overly good job of actually first taking the time to understand what that data is and how we can actually incorporate that and use that into our day-to-day -day operation strategies, our marketing strategies, and so on and so forth. So, you know, when when a dealer hears that, all right, what are some of the first questions they have asked? Is it what kind of a data they should be looking at? What do they do with the data? We'll kind of start the conversation there. So first of all, I say don't be too hard on yourselves. I think yeah. uh, in the manufacturing, and so when you're dealing with physical goods, uh, the uptake to new technologies has been lagging compared to service industry. So again, I'll point back to finance and, and the IT industry. That said, if you're not working on that, you're, you're in big trouble. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we've all heard it before, uh, data is the new oil, uh, and, and that's so true. Great reference, yeah, I you like know, that. And, and it, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to come and reinvent yourself and, and sort of, uh, you know, Re, you know, create a, an Uber for the dealer experience, yeah. you can start small. I mean, the amount of data that potentially is being generated by any dealership is phenomenal, right? From the service department yeah. through to sales. So it's just a matter of, of A, collecting it, B, collecting it in a, in a uniform and identifiable way, and C, cleaning it up. So they'll often mm -hmm. say you want, to, you want to move from what they call a data swamp to a data lake. Once you've, you've done that sort of core work, then you can start to sort of, you know, work with that to uh, increasingly automate, particularly in your credit adjudication or whatnot, um, and, and build out some services that, that might benefit uh, your customers and, and, and retain them as a, a potential customer for you down the road. 100%. And now, to your point, there is an obscene amount of data points within a dealership. I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of different data points, you know, and so I feel that maybe one of the reasons that we've been slow to really embrace this data driven culture, data driven approach to operations and everything is that it just feels like this 
monster, just this heavy, heavy object. So instead of kind of lifting it and kind of working with it, we just kind of continue to kind of tippy toe all the way around it. Um, you know, for dealerships on there, just going, hey, I get it. I, I hear what you guys are saying. My dad is incredibly important, but where do they start? You know, what would you say three places or three data points where are great data points to just start understanding what what that data is and how it affects my business? So that'd be difficult. I'm not a sort of expert in the sort of the, the dealer dynamics. So sure. to say, okay, this data point would be better than the other. Um, so I, I would just go back to my previous answer was just start collecting it, start doing it in a rigorous fashion. You know, um, put your salesperson in bed with one of your, your IT people. Get them working together because, mm-hmm. you know, what dealerships have done you know, well in the past is move that metal. And yes. so they, you know, they want to do that in the future, but how you're going to get around that and how you're going to do that is going to change. So if you have, you know, you don't have those, uh, you know, Deloitte calls them purple people. And, and so, you know, red people being the IT people, blue people being the salespeople. I love that book, if, by the way. It's one of my favorite ones. If you don't put them together, <laughs> yeah. um, you're, you're going to have an issue, right? You're, you're going to get the sort of uh, either a, a system that's not usable or you're going to get, you know, a system that just is not scalable. That's cool. Now let's talk about a little bit more about the data that you guys are really taking a look into. There are some trends, like you said, there's some seismic shifts. What have you seen or what are you guys seeing that would say, hey, there is a significant shift that's happening right now? So, you know, uh, we're looking at the landscape, you know, more broadly. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you, you look at sort of evolutionary biology, you know, you know, life has been on this planet for about 400 you know, million <laughs> years. In that time period, there's been five mass extinctions. Mm-hmm. And, and a mass extinction is where you'll go from, you know, at least 50% to upwards of sort of over 90% extinction rates. Well, you know, I, th- I think the corporate world is facing that now. In the last 18 years, uh, 52% of the Fortune 500 has turned over, yes. whether through bankruptcies, mergers, acquisitions, or whatnot. Yep. And that's only accelerating. The, the latest data I've heard uh, coming out of Chatham House was you'll see a 40% uh, rate in the next 10 years for the Fortune 500. So, you know, uh, things are increasing. Yeah. Also, uh, I had the, uh, the, the privilege of, of meeting um, the uh, chief economist for the OECD. They had done a report uh, where they looked at what they call frontier firms, which mm-hmm. represent the top 5, 10% of, of companies globally, look across 24 companies, and then compared them to the bottom 95%. Mm. And it's become a winner takes all. So, over that 15-year period, they found that this sort of the increase in productivity year over year in that 15-year period for those frontier firms was roughly 2.8%. For the remaining 95 or 95%, it was 0.6%. So that's almost a 400% difference between wow. the, the bottom 95 and the top five, right? That's significant. And when you looked at the data points uh, in the report, that's only accelerating. And that report was released in 2017. We're already on the cusp of 2000 or 2020. Yeah. Um, you know, you you can you just have to do the math, and you can see it's it's becoming increasingly difficult to to catch up if you're if you're not already starting. And see, and I think that translates completely into the into the automotive space. Like it, it 100% that translates over, right? Um, it really uh, puts that saying: the cream rises to the top um, mm-hmm. in actual numbers, right? Um, what we're seeing right now, as far as the industry goes, is you know, look, bottom line, we're going to sell less cars this year than we have in the previous year. It was and coming off of record numbers. So yeah, no, we're we coming off record numbers, yeah. right? Um, you know, we've also come off of record, you know, time frame. You know, for the last five or six years, all right, for the most part, these manufacturers have been putting out damn near double-digit gains yep. quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. Look, that's not sustainable. We're, we're 10 scalable. years in a seven-year cycle, right? Yeah, like, exactly. And perfect. Thank you. And I've been trying to explain this to people, that this is not something new. This has happened before. Yep. You know, I've been in the automotive industry for um, a little over 15 years. So I, I've already seen it happen once. And now I'm beginning to kind of see it kind of happen again as well. But what I'm seeing is that there are dealerships out there that are still prospering. And then there's a lot that are just going kind of caught with the pants down going, oh, crap, you know, what do I do here? I think we've been able to kind of half ass our efforts. Uh, half-ass our operations and still be able to, you know, to your point earlier, be at that bottom with just that, you know, zero, what was it, zero point or point zero six percent of an increase point, in point six percent, point six percent, point six percent of an increase in efficiencies. Um, 
But the dealerships that are prospering right now, and I think will continue to prosper, and they're actually looking at, their numbers are actually increasing year over year. There's a fundamental difference in their operations. It's correct. And also that top 5% is not all the large firms. That, mm-hmm. that includes legacy companies, but also yeah. includes some, some upstarts. And the bottom 95%, similarly so. Um, you know, they, they used to say that the, the average company lasts about 50 years. Uh, I recently saw a report out of the U.S. that was saying 10 years is the new number. Wow. So, you know, um, <laughs> so that, that churn rate is there. It is, you know, there's no doubt it's increasingly competitive. And it's tough, especially, you know, if when, you're, when you're the boss, your job is leadership to stay ahead of those trends and, and to make the right bets. Though, that, though I would say, you know, putting your head in the sand is not the right bet. You're, you're better <laughs> off to be generally right than specifically wrong. Yeah. Right. Um, and it, as I said earlier, it doesn't you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yes. Uh, there's a lot that you can do to ex- to sort of, you know, uh, increase that ROI and, and, and grow your market segment and, and start to serve those customers in the way that they wanted. They want to be served. Uh, you know, a, another mantra I, I've, I've often heard um, is, you know, your your best experience anywhere becomes your new base level everywhere. So, you know, think of, you know, your experience at, at Amazon. And they're, 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 they're talking about predictive sales now, right? So yes. looking at the data that they have and saying, okay, well, you know what? Um, uh, Jason buys toilet paper on a, on a monthly basis. Why wait for him to, to buy it? I'll send him a, 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 the pack that he normally does. And, you know, uh, well, probably funny, eight times out of I 10, you'll, you'll take it. And in fact, actually, I do. I'm a huge Amazon user. I yeah. really am because I cannot stand standing in line going to a retail place. So th- there, there are there are subscription-based retail options now on Amazon. And actually, it's funny you say that because toilet paper is one of the ones I well, use. So go. that was really yeah. kind of funny. Um, and, and we just, just met. And know. we just met. I'm like, hey there. Wow, he really yeah. knows me well. Yeah. Um, but, but no, it, it, you're right. And I think that's the automotive industry really needs to just, they got to stop ignoring it, understand it, and just embrace it. You know, with the new expectation is that we have to meet their expectation. And dealerships, like it or not, that's just the consumer. Well, you know, and data is more than just taking a lot of pictures of the car. You know, mm-hmm. I've, I've been to a number of uh, conferences, spoken at a number of conferences, and sort of, you know, pay attention to what's being said. And, uh, you know, uh, having an online presence, uh, putting up more photos to, to try and drive the sales, that's not digitizing your business. That's mm-hmm. not transforming your business. That's, you know, doing, I, I'm not even sure that's doing the base level transformation that you need to do. Uh, you know, we're, we really are moving towards, you know, uh, driving experience and looking at different revenue streams. So, you know, if we saw margins compress on the automotive sales and then they picked up some of the, uh, some, some of that in the servicing. Well, you know, I'm not an expert on electric vehicles, but my understanding is there's a lot less servicing that's going to be happening with those electric vehicles. So 100%. is that a, is that a, uh, you, you know, is that a viable option in the, in the long term? You know, I think the electrification of, of vehicles is, you know, it's, it's a long way away, but it is growing rapidly and there is an appetite for it, particularly amongst the younger generation. Mm-hmm. You know, similarly with autonomous vehicles, I, you know, that's a, a lot longer out there than I think some people expect. But, you know, it's, I like to think What is of, your personal thought on autonomous vehicles? Because I'm always curious. I like asking everybody this question and it seems like it's split literally right down the middle. Would you do it? Personally, yeah. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, but we're already. You know, uh, I recall I was at a conference, uh, an automotive regulatory conference. Um, oh, it got to be over a decade ago. Yeah. And uh, they, it was in Boston. They had a presentation from some uh, boffins out that from uh, MIT, and they brought along this, you know, uh, large SUV, and it was autonomous. We all had a drive in it in, in the <laughs> parking lot. This is over ten years ago. Now that said. You know, it was a massive SUV, but two people fit in it because the entire back end was was computers, super and, computers, everything yeah, all else. that yep, kind of stuff, yep. right? And it didn't look very pretty, but it was already working. And and the gist of that presentation was, you know, they're going to start introducing, you know, automation in your driving bit by bit, and you've seen it, right? So yeah, oh, yeah. You know, the the lane departure warnings, backup cameras, and you know, now we have you know the hands free driving with Teslas. I mean, you can see them marching us toward it. Now, that said, uh, I think AI is at the point where it requires predictability. So, mm-hmm. again, you, you know, if you, somebody puts a sticker on a stop sign, the majority of autonomous vehicles won't recognize that stop sign. Yep. You know, the, the classic, you know, you're going to have an accident. Who do, you, who do you kill? The old lady, the, the, the baby, or the person driving the car? <laughs> you, you know, those sorts of things still remain issues. Sure. Um, but, again, you know, I think for autonomous vehicles be 
adopted on a wholesale level and then on a legal level, you don't need 100% accuracy. You just need to be, you know, a, 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 a significantly better than a driver. So if, if, you know, driver success rates are, let's say, 80%, then you only need to be 90% on, on an autonomous vehicle for well, adoption. Doesn't that, need to be that's perfect. a good point. I mean, I think a lot of people out there say, I actually, I think we're a lot closer than actually I think most people think we are when it comes to autonomous vehicles. And I think the consumer is the one that will actually probably drive that more. A, because uh, like we said, to your point, it's about the experience. And we are in a culture right now that is just hungry, hungry for experience. But then also just the time valuation portion of autonomous. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking to someone who literally spends between four to five hours a day in the car, driving to eight to 10,000 kilometers a month. If I could get some portion of that back, that is huge huge for me on the personal level and and professional level. So I don't know. I think we might be getting closer there to it. You know, you know, I could see it's, uh, you know, in the city, it's hands off, it's hands free in the city. Yeah. And when you're outside, you can drive. I, I do know, you know, I, I like cars. I like to drive. Um, but not, you know, th- think of it this way. I could drive stick when I talk to the, you know, my young employees, the number of them that can drive stick, almost nobody. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, it's, it's dying off, you know, and I'm the one of the people who bemoan, you know, when, you know, Porsche goes all automatic. I'm like, well, what's stick. the point? I know. Right. Like, right? I, it's I like, faster, I like but <laughs> you know, it's less fun. It's all right. hundred percent. It is. Yeah. So, but these are all data points. Like this, yep. this is what we're seeing. This is the, the consumer is telling us this is the direction we're heading in. So that's one area, but I think another one that we could really see over the next five years and the data showing us is that consumers are incredibly hungry right now for a different model of ownership. You know, so subscription models or yep. something along that line is that, I mean, is the data is there saying the consumer doesn't necessarily want to own the thing. You know, Ford has identified as no longer a, a car company, as a, as a transportation company. Um, you see a lot uh, of a the major uh, OEMs sort of getting into the or, or having, you know, putting a stake in the, in the automotive sharing. Uh, there was a recent uh, book that came out called The Zero Dollar Car uh, and talking that the data that you generate driving your car is worth more than the vehicle itself. And if you would then sign over cool. your data, so think of like a Facebook, it's, it's almost a barter system. Yeah. I'll give you a car, you give me your data, you, you get the car for free. Yeah. You know, and you can see that, in fact, increasingly, I think you're going to see a war over who owns the data that the car generates. Is it going to be the manufacturer? What about rental companies? What about um, the dealership that sells the car? Who's going to own that data and be able to monetize that? Yeah. I think that's a frontier that no one's really talking about right now, but increasingly will become an important one. Uh, the data you generate is important, but the data you generate going from point A to point B is even more so. That's right? actually a really good point. And I think when... Um, dealerships that are watching this or listening to this right now, um, they don't value their data that way. But the rest of the industry out there is getting to the point where, yeah, I mean, they're, I, I saw a company out there that with an app that I could actually download the app and I get paid just to have the app on my phone so mm-hmm. the app can serve me ads. So what it is is I'm guaranteeing that I will take up some certain space in my phone all right, will be dedicated just to that, and I can actually get paid in return for that. You know, the yep. data that a dealership collects, those thousands of points of data that they collect, is incredibly valuable, not just to the dealership and how they operate the dealership, but incredibly valuable to other industries as well. I just don't think we've figured out, we don't quite, we, don't, we haven't grasped onto the concept of how valuable this data is. And slicing and dicing it in, in, in different ways and looking for patterns and outliers. So you, mm-hmm. don't, you don't know. I mean, the way that somebody deals with you on a service uh, side, uh, you know, probably has uh, a huge indicator how to, to predict when they're going to come and buy a new vehicle. 100%. So to combine those two and, and to look and say, okay, how does this look on the aggregate level? And then how does this look on that individual level? Probably will predict. Uh, a, a significant amount so that you can instead of just doing a, a mass mailing to individuals or based on the mileage of the vehicle uh, you looking at the so the usage and historical usage and then comparing that to your, mm-hmm. your your typical customer you can then curate how you're going to how you're going to intersect with that consumer and I and I think increasingly we're moving to um, a, an experience level economy and yes. what I mean is think of um, think of birthday cake right mm-hmm. so when you had a birthday cake uh, at the turn of the century, you know, uh, you would you would make the cake for your for your child. So you'd you'd get the ingredients, you'd you'd, you'd bake a cake, and you'd give it to them. Yeah, by the nineteen fifties, Betty Crocker was the best, right? Nineteen fifties <laughs> Betty Crocker. So she puts it together, and there, you know, there's the uh, the Malcolm Gladwell. You know, you, you break the egg to feel like you're still baking it, but you didn't really need to do that. You'd add water, put it in the oven, and you've got a cake. 
you go fast forward to today, no one's even throwing the party anymore, right? So you can go to Chuck yeah. E. Cheese or um, the Science Center or some one of these sort of experiential places. They'll throw the party for you. And you know what? The cake's free. They throw that in, right? And I think that's indicative to me of where the economy is going, um, where consumers are going and where mm-hmm. businesses need to go if they want to have the consumer. So, you know, uh, there will be those who win uh, just by digitizing things and sort of pushing and commoditizing it. But I think increasingly, particularly in the dealership world, to, to beat, you know, an, an, an Amazon-based platform that sells a car or an eBay-based platform that sells a car, uh, you're going to then have to do a, a curated experience. And there's experiments already happening. So Fiat has, uh, I think it's in Europe, but it could be in North America, virtual showroom. So, you, you know, you, you go on, there's a salesperson yeah, in the room a with a headset. A couple manufacturers are testing you know, with that. You can you kick the tires from the, you know, from, from, your, from your home. Um, you've got, you know, uh, a Genesis, a Hyundai, right? They, they, they're trying to deliver, deliver the vehicles. So it's a more curated experience. You don't even leave, need to leave your house. Everything's done digitally. Um, those, those sorts of experiences I think you're going to see more of. And then consumers are, are, are craving the, not just the, 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 the acquisition. There's, you know, cars represent more than just, you know, going from point A to point B, as we sort of alluded yes, to earlier with statement. the stick shit conversation, right? So, yeah. um, yeah, it's statement, it's freedom, it's, and, and, I think the comments that millennials are not into buying cars is garbage. That's not true. It's just no. they're putting putting it off because I think, I think marketing agencies love to just pitch that out there yeah. because they're the only ones that have the solution on how to sell to millennials. So like I I think the whole thing is just total BS. But anyways, I digress. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, to that point, um, big fan of sort of you know Roman and Greek literature, and I was reading Pliny the Younger, and there's a pithy point where he's like, ah, kids today, literally, right? So this is you know <laughs> See, back in Roman times. So. It's, it's, you know, it's always been there. <laughs> it's, you know, variations of a theme. Yep. Yeah. So the data is showing that the consumers are demanding an experience-based um, ownership, experience-based purchasing process. Um, how, it, on the ownership side, because you have a lot of guys' data point when it comes to leasing, all right, what, are, what shifts are you seeing there in the leasing world? Well, you know, I think uh, what's driving a lot of sales, and I don't know I'm saying anything particularly insightful, sure. but it's, it's, it's everything is payment driven. Yes. Right. And that's the attraction to a lease, you know, um, a lease, you can come in at a, a lower, uh, a lower point than a, than a regular financing, you know, 91% of vehicles are financed, whether it's traditional financing or leasing. Sure. Of course. Um, and if you're driving it by, by that sort of what your monthly payment is, there's two ways you're going to do it. You're either going to lease the vehicle and then you're always in a new vehicle or you're going to extend the loan terms. And that's why we've seen that, that mm-hmm. March along. I've, I've, uh, I've seen upwards of nine year terms on a loan. Uh, yet the, the consumers still churn that car, you know, something like five and a half years out. Yeah. So you also see the side, you know, impact on the, the growth of, of um, negative equity in vehicles. Right. So that's becoming a, a higher share. So there's lots of things that we need to to adjust to, you know, because that there is a cannibalization of your future sales if you sort of go down that oh, that road. Um, so you have to be, you know, mindful of that. But that's, you know, consumers want what they want; they want it now. And, yes. and what's driving that is that that low monthly payment. So a, as a company, I'm just curious for your company, are, are subscription models? Is that a conversation for you guys? Is this like how can we prepare ourselves for if the industry starts to move or pivot in that direction? So yeah, we you know our members are having that conversation. You yeah. know, a big uh, example of that is there's a lot of lot of chat around uh, blockchain, blockchain chain technology and its impact. Okay, is that is that more is there more conversation towards that than there is towards potential subscription models? I, I no, I, th- I think it's there's not no, no one's betting the farm on on one model yet, right? Yeah. So all the, all the manufacturers, well not all, but I, I was I would hazard a guess that the man, the majority of manufacturers are are betting some money on the subscription model. But okay. in terms of blockchain, it's a little bit different. That's sort of, uh, you, you could get, for example, uh, using blockchain, you can attach that to parts and vehicles and consumers, and you could almost get into, a, not even almost, you, you literally could start doing um, predictive repairs. And we're already seeing that in the equipment side. So oh, as I said earlier, our members are equipment, uh, consumer auto and fleet. Okay. And on, on the equipment side, you're starting to see that as particularly, you know, these massive earth movers, right? Yeah. Huge, um, huge monster things. You know, uh, one tire is $50,000 or more. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, the downtime that, uh, a, an unscheduled repair represents in terms of sort of lost 
revenue it's huge it's huge so being able to you know as the manufacturer who's producing these things again uh-huh. remember i was talking about using your data earlier you yeah. look at it in the aggregate and then look at it in the specific well you apply that to the vehicle and you can say well you know we've seen a thousand of these earth movers in this particular park or widget uh breaks around this time look at the specific use of this vehicle compared it to the to the aggregate and you sure. can, you can have a pretty good sense of when something's going to fail i mean things are made to you know increasingly higher level of tolerances i mean cars are lasting longer because of that yeah so you the app, a blockchain application can have a significant impact i could see that you know translating into the auto experience and again yeah, that'd curating be really cool. you know giving someone a shout and saying hey uh you, you know the data that your car is generating and we get to the future where you're, that there's a, a condo where you have access to it you could call them in and in advance and say i think you should come in your your alternator is about to go or you know we believe it is and and so instead of having a breakdown on the road and they're upset with the vehicle you well, know, see that's the thing see the experience is bad yeah right i mean because um my vehicle is incredibly important right driving eight to ten thousand kilometers a month I, I i'm in the service department every single month yeah you know doing service and I, I actually do push sometimes my service department to look at things that may not be identified as an issue, but I can't afford. If if for, if for something was happened to my vehicle and it's out of commission for several days, that really significantly affects my business, yep. but also just my, my abilities just to handle my day-to-day life. So I would be all for if they just came out and told me like a predictive model saying, hey, Jason, just so you know, you're around this kilometer, you're averagely using this above the average point. You know, we should actually replace that part now. Yep. You know, before, I, and I, I'd be totally okay with it because to your point before, it's that, that negative experience of now being stuck on the side of the road because the part the part broke. Yeah, no, perfectly. That's I think that's a perfect example. Or just even communicating on, on um, uh, you know, recall is better, you know, Mm, people don't get upset yeah. you know it's, it's better that you've you've done you, you you bite the bullet do the recall and you get that fixed as opposed to you wait for that for that issue to happen down the road i think those days you know of uh well we'll, we'll let that you know the number of people that that will actually impact and then that will turn around and sue us and, and that's it's better just to ignore it there from a financial position uh, that that doesn't fly anymore and mm-hmm. you, you you see you know corporate reputations we, and we've seen that in the automotive industry um in the past number of years i mean uh, they go up and they go down and they go and that happens quite readily. Consumers increasingly have uh, a stronger voice and, and more power and we as companies need to be advised when we make our decisions that take that into account. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still, my head is still in this predictive service model because, you know, just, you know, being on the other side of the table and being a dealer principal, I'm just going, I would really, really like this. I mean, and, and the thing is, that you, to your point, the data points are there. Yep. I mean, it's easy for me to say, you know, out of, uh, if I looked at every single 2012 Corolla that I'm servicing, all right, it would be easy to see, you know, when does, you know, the transmission have an issue, right? And just really calculate that out and say, wow, there's a bit of a pattern here. It seems like right around 160, 170,000 kilometers, this is when we begin to have transmission issues yep. or belt issues or chain issues or whatever, alternator issues, whatever the hell it is, right? Correct. And I, and I think it requires a partnership between the dealers and, and the manufacturers. You, yes. It's, it's, they're, they're both going to be important parts of that, which for the dealer community is important, right? Because there's a trust factor wondering. with the consumer you would have to get as well, though. Because, Correct. Because right now, you got to understand, for a lot of service dealerships out there, that trust factor with the consumer is not quite there. See, it, it's a little different on, I mean, it makes sense on the big heavy equipment, right? It's, it, it, there's such a monetary loss if that equipment is down uh, for me, for, for that service provider to come out and say, hey, look, we should really get on top of this in advance because it's yep. going to be, but it's like, how do we, you know, well, our, our experience yeah. hasn't changed enough. You know, the way we the way we service cars and the way that we've been selling cars really fundamentally hasn't changed in a hundred years. Well, <laughs> or, or has it? So you know, maybe it's a way of how you position it. So okay. I don't have a Tesla, but uh, I'm aware of of Teslas. Yep. And I understand that they do software updates. So you know, effectively a repair to your vehicle by over over, over the internet. So you know, yeah. your Tesla is connect when you park it connects to your your wireless and and they can they can do a software patch. I mean, famously they increased the you know, the zero to sixty time with a software update, right? Yeah. Just a, a tweak, is, and they can do that if they can push that over the air. So you know, 
it's potentially there. I mean, it is generating the data, but it's not. Is it is it being captured and transmitted in a way that we can then take advantage of it? Mm-hmm. And if I said to you as a, a, a to a consumer, it's like, well, you can sign on to this package. It won't cost you any money. And here's the benefits in, in terms of you know predictive repairs. And and by the way. Uh, and this is where the reputation is important. You know, GDPR out of Europe, we, you know, we're going to protect your data. It's going to be anonymized. Um, you'll have to be, you know, people be concerned about, you know, are you going to track my speeding? And, you know, that's that's where putting a black box with your insurance company, I think, is a little bit different versus with the manufacturer. Have you done that? No. <laughs> I haven't either. I just I told you why. like driving. Trust it's, the last thing like, I need is a black box on my like, computer. I have a mental block with it. I'm yeah. like the same way. I'm like, yeah, I don't think I want them knowing what I did on the highway. But I, there, there may be a day where it comes where it's, you know, the incentive is so strong you you effectively don't have a choice. I think that's what it is. I think what it is is the incentive is not strong enough yet for me to do so. Yeah. But um, yeah, I keep getting back to this. Uh, you know, I was, I was thinking like, a, for example, uh, you, you talk to a Ford diesel mechanic. Okay. If, if, if you're driving a 2013 to 2014 F-250, all right, everybody knows the head gasket has a, has a leak at 60,000 kilometers. Like, it's, it's like common knowledge, mm-hmm. right? But it's so funny. I'll watch a service department. I'll watch a customer come in and make a complaint. And then the advisor go, how many kilometers you got? And the answer, oh, yeah, yeah. I already know what the problem is. So, yeah. Okay, well, wait a second. You already knew what the problem was. Why weren't we being proactive enough to reach out to the customer knowing that it was going to be an issue? And it's a warrantied issue, so it's not necessarily going to be a cost issue, right? Yep. It's just an, a commonly known issue with, you know, with those trucks. It's like, but you push out marketing material yeah, to the consumer thinking, based on right? their mileage already. Why can't you do that for the, for repairs? So there's a perfect example. It's yeah. a low hanging fruit. So you don't again, you know, I I often say. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you should. You, you got to get started. You, you you need to sort of turn your mindset to that mm-hmm. direction and say, okay, you know, what can I do today and look for opportunities like that. That that exists. I I think every dealer listening right now can has an can implement like that. that within, you know, a couple of weeks. I bet. Oh yeah, I guarantee you. If they sit down with their tax or their service managers and say, guys, give me the most five common things, they go, well, you know, Rav Fours have this, or uh, Ford Focuses have this, or Chevy Silverados, they do this. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, well, then why are we waiting for these customers to come? Why are we not proactively doing that? But that's probably the difference between that five percent we were talking earlier. That top five percent of the businesses that even as we start to see things decline, and they will. Yep. It's just a given. It will. Sorry, guys, it's going to happen. Right. That's kind of that fundamental difference, I think, between that top five percent and that real low percent. You know, you know, uh, you know, when a recession happens, because it's never mm. if. I, I don't think we've, you know, we've. You is know, that what we're calling this, by the way? Like, I don't. We're not there yet. I think okay. this is, you know, I'm hearing this. You know, people are having uh, one of the best years they've ever had. So you I know, know. I've, uh, I've famously, you know, uh, have been been calling for for a downturn <laughs> for the last you know year and a half two years and and i've been wrong eventually i'll be right you know it's like saying that's it's the best rain. part right eventually it's gonna rain hey, you keep you keep betting on red it's gonna hit <laughs> no. um but you know if i could time the market we wouldn't have this conversation i'd be, <laughs> be relaxing in the bahamas that's right that's right exactly um but it, it will come and uh you know i'm doing this with my own company i uh, so you know i'm 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 being conservative in some ways, you know, okay. I'm, I'm being conservative in predicting my revenue stream. Yep. But I'm doubling down on the investments in my company. We, you know, we are going through a digital transformation. I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm walking the walk that I'm talking. We're That's we're cool. currently cleaning up our data. We're currently embracing new technologies. We're we're currently deployed, you know, a brand new suite of software and, and hardware in, in in our company to you know meet those what I see as 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 you know our members' future member needs. So you you sort of you need to save and invest your way out of any kind of a recession. So it's a little bit of both, right? It's, Actually, it's that like balance. That. Can we walk down that a little bit better? Because I think that's that's a good point, right? It's that I, I think what happens, and I see this happen a lot right now, you know, um, dealerships are do one of two things when this happens. They start to fill that pinch a little bit. Mm-hmm. Either they kind of suck right back into their shell and stop everything, right? Yep. Or they go almost kind of wild and put a blindfold on and just start, aiming and shooting at anything and everything, right? Yep. And then there is something kind of that's in, in between there. And I like that you used, what was it, investing for preparation? So you need to save and invest your way at, yeah. a, at, a, at a potential downturn. Yeah, yeah, I want to explore a little more of that. What do you mean exactly by that? I just think, you know, sort of I, maybe it's my philosophy in life, mm-hmm. but I think, you know, uh, you know, everything in moderation, including moderation, right? So, you know, you don't want to overreact. I mean, if you, this is where, you know, I don't feel as I get older, I'm any wiser, 
but I definitely am more experienced. You know, mm-hmm. I, I do have a couple of recessions under my belt. I know what they look like. I know that they're inevitable. And so you can plan accordingly. You don't need to, you know, panic. Yes. But at the same time, you, you, to, your, to your point, you don't need to overreact and, and sort of, this, maybe this is not the time to be double, doubling down to something that's particularly aggressive and risky. Yeah. You know, but there are things that you can do that can build your market share, prepare you to, to better face the recession, both in terms of, again, you know, maybe a little bit more conservative forecasting, but also taking a little bit of money, putting it aside and, and, and trying to do something novel and interesting and, and more data driven. I, I think the, and you tell me wrong, but I, I think for dealerships out there that are listening to this, the best preparation that they can do for their dealership right now is create a data driven experience, both on the sales side or the service side. Would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. I'll go back to my, my, my previous comment, right? Your your best experience anywhere becomes your baseline experience everywhere, right? Yeah, that's true. So think, you know, when when people come to the to the to your dealership to set up an appointment, if you're not already allowing them to, you know, tweak their or set up their appointments digitally, they have to call. They, you'll call your reception, yes. and then get somebody in service. Somebody in service will look through the calendar, set you in a, an appointment, then you get back to the office like, oh man, I have a meeting now you got to go back on the phone call the reception go to the reception or to, to service you can't speak to anyone in service you got to speak to charlene in service i mean that's not a great experience yes right being able to do that digitally you know so there's a calendar you can you can you can go on their website and, and tweak your appointment you're done and and sends you an appointment to your your outlook calendar that's that you can do that today so you know? i think that's a good point see what i think a lot of dealerships when they think of the experience they think this this just big heavy and animated object but it's actually not it's it's a it's a whole whack ton of a series of these little um micro moments you know yeah. so it's like but but i actually really agree with you i would say that probably over 90 percent of dealerships have an online you know service appointment form on their website yep. but when you call in i would say less than 25 percent of them actually in their on hold message talk at all that hey are you tired of staying on hold would you like to speed up the process you can visit www.abcmotors hit the service button to schedule your service appointment i now. had that exact experience the other day did I you bring my car in for a servicing went to the telephone experience when i was standing in the dealership handing my key over i turned around and behind me is a poster saying hey you could have done this all online did that not kind right. of like piss you off a little bit did i mean just uh, like oh, yeah, well, i'm a pretty no, even tempered okay, guy here, but yeah but, I did it piss me off. I, I could tell the lady beside me was not having a good day, but uh, you know, but she so her issue could have been solved electronically. And here's here's I'll, I'll I'll digress a little bit. Yeah, her big thing was you know don't you do any repairs until I've seen it, right? They, there's a fundamental lack of trust with with car dealers, right? Everybody it, thinks it is they're out to get me, right? Yep. You know, and I'm a lawyer by training, so I can you know I'm probably lower than a car dealer on the totem pole of trust. So well, we're actually yeah. up there with you. It, yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's uh, people enjoy going to the dealership as much as they enjoy going to the dentist or seeing their lawyer. Yeah. So yeah, we're right there with you. And it should be a great experience, right? You're buying a new car, you're yes. getting your car is coming back to you repaired and and hopefully washed, right? I mean, um, what's going to differentiate you? Well, so I, I'm listening to her, and her, and her whole thing is she's worried that they're going to rip her off on the repairs. They're going to be too aggressive. They're going to replace a brake pad that, that has a couple more. Clearly, she's had an experience that Correct. has jaded her at some point. But there's, you know, uh, I think of an example. I think it's Audi that's doing it. And again, they use an online platform. Mm-hmm. Um, they make they take a little video of the part. They go, here's what needs to be replaced. They show you what they're going to do. They show you the last one. You you can watch that on your phone. Click yes. You've seen it. It's done. It builds trust. You don't have to do a phone call, leave messages. They don't. They're not there to see it. Okay, wait. I'll come and look at it. <laughs> it can all. It, it can all be done. In fact, not can be. It is being done. People are doing it right, and you don't need to be Audi to do it. I think a small, you know, a, a decently funded dealership probably could put something together. Yeah, where they can push that out. It doesn't have to be on an app. Even if it's on an email. Like you don't. As again, as I said, you know, you could start small. But, you know, execute, you, you know, you can have the grandiose, the biggest plans. And if you're out there planning all the time and never executing, then what's the point? Oh, hundred percent. Right? So, you know, get a vision. So, you know, we're, we're, we're talking strategy today. Yeah. Um, you know, I know what it's like to be a manager. You know, you, you know, I'm, I'm the president and CEO, but we're a small company. So I'm, you know, I'm chief cook and bottle washer. At, <laughs> yeah, at, at the I know company. how it is. Yep. You know, I'm managing people, but I have my own tasks to do. And you get caught up in the day-to-day fires. But you really do need to take time to, to, to step back and, and to do some strategic thinking. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, 
it's no wonder people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, what's the number one thing to do? They, they're, they're reading books all the time, right? Yes. They're, they're, they, they have a big picture. They're, they're looking at what, what's happening in the world, and then they're sort of taking that and bringing it to their own, their own corner of the world and, and, and implementing something. So, you know, uh, uh, dealers would be, would be wise to do the same, you know, if not on an annual basis, you know, at, at bare minimum, well, take I, a day or two, get your management. I think it's a together. weekly thing. I really you think know? it is. I mean, no, even, I agree. Even, even, at even least it, once a year. I mean, I actually do it on a daily basis. I take yeah. that, I take that 30 to 45 minute drive home and just kind of recap everything strategically to just ensure that we're still in line so that we continue to move forward. Yep. I'll meet with the team once a week, right? Uh, or at least a portion of the team, my immediate operations team, and then the full team once every two weeks. But I, I think to your point that um, the key to doing what you just stated is that we have to be intentful with our time. Um, I spend a lot of times in dealerships. Uh, in being intentful with their time is not normally a practice that they're accustomed to doing. It's yep. they're, they're normally coming in, you know, in their firefighter suit with their hose over their shoulder, prepared to put out whatever fires, you know, literally just got lit that morning. Yep. And, and that kind of seems, continues to control their days. But I bet you that's a fundamental difference between that top 5% we were talking about earlier in efficiencies and that bottom percent that has not moved much at all. You know, think about this way you know if you don't have a strategic plan you don't have a mission you don't mm -hmm. have high level goals when you make a decision where are you orienting yourself you're going to be like a mm -hmm. kid on sugar with ADD you're just going to be going after whatever happens to catch your eye you're not going to you're not going <laughs> to have true. a focused path forward now you don't have to be a slave to that but you should be thinking to yourself right so you know where do I see this company this industry in the next 5 to 10 years and orient yourself in that direction and, you know, every year you're going to, you know, reorient it. It's like, you know, a tugboat pushing a large ship. It's, it's not going to happen yeah. overnight. But if you put some rigor and some mindfulness to the decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that will, that little tweak alone will, will put you in well, good yeah, stead and, just, and take you up that extra notch that you need to do. 100%. It's modernizing our processes, yeah. you know, and um, I think what's also key for uh, dealer principles, and this is kind of to you, to, you know, if this is not your forte, then get someone else to do it. You know, uh, the one thing I found uh, that's uh, it's been a key point to my success is that I'm very self-aware of what my abilities are. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I'm a bull in a china shop. I know that um, my team describes me as the hammer. You know, now I have a couple of other people that work on the operations side, and I call them my scalpels. And you just kind of have to know, you know, what you need to get what tool you're going to need to get that project done. Yeah. But, you know, if if this is not, if you don't feel comfortable that say, hey, um, I am want to modernize our processes. I don't know necessarily what process to start off with. And I don't know if I necessarily have the patience to sit down to consume the data necessary to make the modifications to the process that the customer would actually appreciate. Then I, I think you just have to admit it to yourself and find somebody that is going to be willing to do that for you. Yeah, you can't do everything, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, time is money. Um, so you, you want to double down those areas that you're going to bring value. Yeah. And if you you know if, if you're fortunate and you're in charge of a large team, then you can you you have the opportunity to delegate more. But even if you're a small team, I think there's no excuse. You you do yeah. need to take the time to to be a leader, right? I mean, uh, if you want to be successful, then that's where you're going to bring the most value to your company. And you have your team looking at you for exactly that. And I and I would go so far as to be, you don't need to be the president and the CEO to be a leader. You can be the secretary and be yeah. a leader. Everyone can have an impact uh, and, and good ideas come from every level of the organization. And so just being mindful that, you know, the way that I, uh, you know, I bring value to the company, will have will have an impact. So if everyone has that sort of owner mindset and you hire people that have that owner mindset, um, I think you will find that the, that the, you know, if you have the, the systems in place to reward that behavior, um, it, it will have a dramatic impact on your business. Yeah, we don't have to carry this on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. And um, I find, you know, strategically, if I think of all the dealerships out there right now that are performing at the top 5%, all right, uh, that's a kind of a consistency trait I find with them, is that the element or the accountability portion, or the execution portion, of getting some of these strategies done or modernizing some of their processes are, is never held by one person. Mm -hmm. It are multiple people that are in charge of executing and developing out what these strategies are going to be. Um, but I think at, at the end of the day is that 
you know, what's that, what's that saying? If we don't modernize, we die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of where we're at right now. Like I'm, I'm going to say with dealerships right now that over the next five, 10 years, if you don't modernize, you're yeah. just going to die. I think manufacturers and even some manufacturers have to feel that pain a little bit as well. Well, listen, you know, we're all just waiting for the Chinese and the, the Indians to come over, right? I mean, <laughs> the Koreans came. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, again, I, I will. It's it's not an an if. It's a when. That's I mean, it's, a, it's a really inevitable. Point. They yeah. will come. Um, I think one of the differences is they're not going to come with the Hyundai Pony. No, they're going to come with whatever the Chinese equivalent of the Tesla is. They're, yes. they're they're going to compete on a immediately at a higher footing. I think than what what we have been used to uh, in in the West in the past. And uh, you know. Um, after 2000, I would say uh, the, the world is much more connected. You, you know, mm-hmm. if you, you, you cast your mind back to um, what, what was it called? Uh, when, when the data was going to turn over. Oh, I can't remember what the Oh, term. Y2K. Y2K. Yeah, I remember that. You know, we, 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 we connected ourselves. <laughs> I was ourselves. working in the dealership at that time. Yeah. Everybody was freaking out. I, I was working as a lawyer with the, with the police, and, and we, were, it, we had plans in place. We were putting in... Uh, you know, uh, fuel depots at the regional headquarters so we can keep the cars on the road, backups for when the radio system collapses because the previous lawyer, when he negotiated, didn't get a, a certificate for Y2K compliance. So, you know, all, but you know, you, you have to be prepared, right? Yes. In, in, the, in those instances. But we became, as, as a globe, much more connected from that. And mm-hmm. that's increased our, our, the competitiveness, right? I mean, we're, we are now competing. I, I see it with, with law firms, you, you know, uh, AI and and that interconnectivity now it's it's the the white collar jobs the sort of the, the middle white collar jobs that are being automated out yeah you know, I, I agree uh, large that, law 100%. firms they have they have offices in the Philippines that do a lot of the contract work mm-hmm. because a lawyer in the Philippines is being paid less than probably their legal uh, clerk in in on Bay Street <laughs> and they can they they at different times so they can have that contract back to you you ask for it at six p.m. it's on your desk at eight a.m. because they've been working through the night but the night is their day right <laughs> that's happening that was happening ten years ago yeah. You know, where are we at today? You know, you have software in the legal uh, industry now, which which does basic legal memos, can do basic research for you. You're automating yep. out that sort of that that level. Um, and so you're 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 in a way have an advantage if you're dealing with, you know, bricks and mortars or a clicks and mortars, I guess. It's or, actually or probably physical true. We, we actually, yeah, you're right. The, we've, the outsourcing is not necessarily your... You're, I'm not saying your entry level job, but that, that blue collar job, what we're actually outsourcing is now even more expensive because through automation, AI, we're able yeah. to do so. So the prediction is uh, McKinsey did a report today, 65% of common tasks, at least in the financial sector, mm-hmm. can be automated, like today. Um, currently, large companies have, are they're about 20% of the way there. So they yep. got a long way to go. And that, that includes the, you know, many of the large companies out there. The impact on workers, which will be predominantly in that well-paid middle section, yep. there's going to be 30% that are going to be displaced. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean 30% that don't have a job. There, there's a number that are going to be trained. There's a demographic trend that's going to ameliorate a little bit of that impact. You'll end up with about, let's say, 5% displacement is the prediction. Mm-hmm. But 30% of people are going to th- go through a substantial retraining. And that's not comfortable, yeah. Right, or, and, and we're, I think we're seeing. But also, the I find that, that locks down that space too. So yeah. people that are going to be entering into that space are going to be a lot less than the what there were before. So even the people that are currently there, to your point, but getting new, <clears throat> getting new people into that yeah. space is going to be far. But I'll far use the, the example of credit adjudication. I mean, you yeah. still need individuals, particularly when you don't have your standard, uh, you, you know. Um, Still you know, high, high score, yeah. uh, good credit c- customer. That can be probably you know ninety nine percent automated out. Um, but so, but you still need you still need somebody to to make the decision, and you need to explain it, right? And that's the other thing with algorithms; they're a bit of a black box. You know, like yep. yes, it came out with the the right answer, but explain to the regulator or the pissed off consumer who's denied credit why. Yeah, there's that's still a challenge. there's still. It's it's funny because we can automate a lot of different things, but when it comes to that financing portion, there's still a bit of an art form to it. You know, having that experience, looking for it, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the algorithms are looking. It or, or on the front, every front end right? of the dealership, as we were talking earlier. So what's the right fit for you? Yeah. Is it leasing? Is it financing? I mean, you, you have a, a perfect opportunity when you have that person in the box to find the, the, the right tool for them. And, and I, I really mean that, fu- you know, 
finding the right tool for them. I mean, if you just push them to a product that maybe is going to drive you more revenue in the short term, I think you're looking at the you're approaching it the wrong way. You well, have that's not that's that's not that customer expectation, right? We were talking Correct. earlier how yeah. you're saying that it's other verticals that have actually raised what that expectation is, mm -hmm. um, and Amazon's done a perfect job of that. In fact, actually, when I look at a product, I start to scroll down. It's giving me the options of other products, some are more expensive, some are less expensive. So yeah, it's no, 100%. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and this is where the curating factor can happen, where a good salesperson can sit down and you know, go, you're already finding them the right car, why don't you, you know, no one spends any time researching how they're gonna pay for the bloody thing, right? And help them with that so they walk away with the right experience. Because now you've got a repeat customer, and, you're, and, you, and that will be amplified in, t in today's world of social media, that this is the place to go because they got me in there. That they'll figure it out eventually. No, so I agree with you, and I think we try to do that, right? Yeah. We, we try to move salespeople over to what we call the consultants, you know? Mm -hmm. But the problem is we didn't really train them on what the hell that actually meant, you know? Uh, there is an element to salespeople out there that they have to be financial consultants, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, people are coming in looking at a long, long-term long lease or long-term financing, but that may not actually be financially responsible for them and what their needs are and what they're doing and their career so on and so yeah. forth and a, and a shorter term lease may be way more appropriate but we're, we haven't quite taken that that approach yet we're still well, we're still so focused yeah. on selling the metal you know and moving the metal that we kind of forget customers are still not at the center point of everything that we do yeah there, there are certain things i think we're getting better with but it's not everything yet so it's a challenge because that's that's a high risk game too right it think is. about it i mean we all know the guy down the street's going to do it he's you, just you know. going to show the lower payment correct right? exactly um uh, you know, we saw it, I, I recall, back in the day with uh, admin fees before we had all on pricing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, I, 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 I had, I've seen in my career $1,500 admin fees. Well, of course, that car was advertised cheaper. Yes. Everyone's selling it for roughly the same a new car. They, yep. they're, they're within a spinning distance of one another. But if you can sort of take out 1500 off the top. Now, you, you get that sale because that consumer is there. It's like, oh, you know, I'm here now. I might as well sign it. But are they going to come back? Well, see, know, I think are that's they, the what point. are they going to tell your, their friends about you? Are they going to say go yeah. go to this dealer? I don't, so I, I think don't that's think a short term are. game to me. It, it, it is. Yeah. It's a short term game we've been playing for a long time. So how and and the inter and internet technology is now disaggregating that. So yes, um, that's why you know they've when the consumer comes in. They oftentimes know more about that vehicle than the salesperson because the salesperson needs to know the whole line. Oh, that's line. one of my biggest pet peeves. Right, they I, need I the just, whole line. Uh, I know, but I still, car. Yeah. I, I still have a lot of issues with that. I cross the line. I'm like, you're calling yourself a professional. Be Fair a, enough. Be an effing professional. Just Fair enough. Like, I, it drives me nuts. But I, like, consumers are coming you know, in more informed than ever, right? I, I agree on the vehicle yeah. themselves, but I still think, on to your point, on the finance side, they're not. Not at all. And that's that, where you have an opportunity. That's where I think the opportunity is, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we're looking from a from an experience perspective, right? Look, customers, we all know. We all know and we all say, you know, they'll ultimately come in thinking that they're going to pay something. But then once the value uh, proposition has been shown as far as the experience, yeah. they'll they'll spend way more for for that experience. I mean, how cool would it be if I came in to purchase a vehicle and after my test drive, I sat down with the dealership's financial expert, and that financial expert now came and asked me a series of questions to understand my 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 financial uh, space, and then developed a payment that was customized and appropriate for me. And who knows? Maybe it wasn't a seventy-two term loan. Maybe it's a sixty-six month term loan. Yeah. But that's because it fed my. That was that's an experience that's not being out there right now. And then couple all. that with your it predictive might be repairs, yeah, right? Exactly. So they're getting email updates that you know, or you can, with some degree of certainty, say that they're going to need done. Yes. Um, you curate their experience. You don't just finish the sale and then wait for them to come back. You know, at the end of their their loan term or lease term, you 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 intersect with that that customer, give them a great experience. You know, and and you'll get them back. So you're not selling them one car; you'll sell them three cars, and you, you'll become, you know, th 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 that relationship. Yeah, you're not going to do a six-year term. You're going to sell them three cars over the six years instead of the one car over the. And six years. And you're not going to do that just on price, you know. No. And so my, you know, your mindset may be going back to the cake analogy: is do you want to sell them the cake or do you want to sell them the entire party? Yes. Right. So again, you know, I think there there's a lot of room for creativity. There's a lot of room. Um, to to squeeze out some more ROI. Yes. Uh, this is an industry that's that's really is ripe for disintermediation, <laughs> and it's either going to happen point. internally or it will you know be some kid in in uh, Silicon Valley who who comes up with it, and you're not going to beat them on price. No. There's just no way. 
No. Right. You've lost that war. So you'll have to do it on experience. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, and I actually think that's probably a great place for us to stop there because I think we've given the listeners and the audience so much to chew on here. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not about the price and it is going to be about the experience. And we have to be intentful with the time that we have on a day to day basis to ensure that we're creating a more modern process. It, it, somewhere as simple as, to your point before, with servicing. Right? If you didn't know that you could go online to do it, the on hold message and not share that. It, it's all these little things, but it's these little things that make a huge difference. And that makes the difference between you being in the top 5% or the bottom of the bucket. That's right. Start now, start today, yeah. start small, but orient to a larger vision. Yeah, it's it's like a snowball effect. Once you kind of start, it just keeps rolling, keeps rolling, keeps rolling, going into it. Yep, this is awesome. Hey, Perfect. for everybody out there that's watching or listening right now, but would learn to would like to learn more about what you guys do or connect with yourself. What is yep. the best way to do so? So, uh, a website currently is the best way. So it's uh, yep. www.cfla-acfl.ca. Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Well, hey. thanks for the opportunity, Jason. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Michael. That was a blast. Cheers.